All right. Hello, friends. Welcome. It's Thursday. Finally Thursday, um, second half of the week. So we are going to pick back up with where we were with chapter 14. Um, all right. So we found out that uh, Mr. Collins is coming to visit. Mr. Collins is the son of uh, Mr. Bennett's cousin. Um, and Mr. Collins is the one who's going to inherit the estate of Longburn when Mr. Bennett passes away. And um, basically, like, it's going to leave leave the girls penniless. So he's come to visit them to, like, make amends, get to know them. But he's, like, just really awkward, just a painful human being who's been complimenting everything, like, too much and over-apologizes. And it's just kind of, like stuffy and weird and pompous and he like really really too much like like it he's like totally subservient to his patron um lady catherine de berg um so he's having dinner with the family let's pick back up chapter 14 during dinner mr bennett scarcely spoke at all but when the servants were withdrawn, he thought it time to have some conversation with his guest, and therefore started a subject in which he expected him to shine, by observing that he seemed very fortunate in his patroness. Lady, Lady Catherine de Bourgh's attention to his wishes and consideration for his comfort appeared very remarkable. Mr. Bennet could not have chosen better. Mr. Collins was eloquent in her praise. The subject elevated him to more than usual solemnity of manner, and with a most important aspect, he protested that he had never in his life witnessed such behavior in person in a person of rank, such affability and condescension as he himself as he had himself experienced from Lady Catherine. She had been graciously approved, pleased to approve of both the discourses which he had already, which he had already had the honor of preaching before her. She had also asked him twice to dine at Rosings, and had sent for him only the Saturday before to make up her pool of quadrille in the evening. Lady Catherine was reckoned proud by many people he knew, but he had never seen anything but affability in her. She had always spoken to him as she would to any other gentleman. She made not the smallest objection to his joining in the society of the neighborhood, nor to his leaving his parish occasionally for a week or two to visit his relations. She had even condescended to advise him to marry as soon as he could, provided he choose with discretion, and had once paid to him a visit in his humble parsonage, where she had perfectly approved all the alterations he had been making, and had even vouchsafed to suggest some herself, some shelves in the closets upstairs. "'That is all very proper and civil, I am sure,' said Mrs. Bennet, "'and I dare say she is a very agreeable woman.' it is a pity that great ladies in general are not more like her does she live near you sir the garden in which stands my humble abode is separated only by a lane from rosings park her ladyship's residence i would think i, I think you said she was a widow sir has she any family she has only one daughter the heiress of rosings and a very extensive property Ah, cried Mrs. Bennet, shaking her head. Then she's better off than many girls. And what sort of young lady is she? Is she handsome? She is most charming. She is a most charming young lady indeed. Lady Catherine herself says that, in point of true beauty, Miss de Bourgh as far, is far superior to the handsomest of her sex, because there is that in her features which marks the young woman of distinguished birth. She is, unfortunately, of a sickly constitution, which has prevented her from making that progress in many accomplishments which she could not otherwise have failed of, as I am informed by the lady who superintended her education, and who still resides with them. But she is perfectly amiable, and often condescends to drive by my humble abode in her little phaeton and ponies. Has she been presented? I do not remember her name among the ladies at court. Her indifferent state of health unhappily prevents her being in town, and by that means, as I told Lady Catherine myself one day, had deprived the British court of its brightest ornament.'
Her ladyship seemed pleased with the idea, and you may imagine that I am happy on every occasion to offer those little delicate compliments which are always acceptable to ladies. I have more than once observed to Lady Catherine that her charming daughter seemed born to be a duchess, and that the most elevated rank, instead of giving her consequence, would be adorned by her. These are the kind of little things which please her ladyship, and it is sort of it is a sort of attention which I conceive myself particularly bound to pay. You judge very properly, said Mr. Bennet, and it is happy for you that you possess the talent of flattery with delicacy. May I ask whether these pleasing attentions proceed from the impulse of the moment or are the result of previous study? They arise chiefly from what is passing at the time, and though I sometimes amuse myself with suggesting and arranging such little elegant compliments as may be adapted to ordinary occasions, I, I always wish to give them as unstudied an air as possible. Mr. Bennet's expectations were fully answered. His cousin was absurd as he had hoped, and he listened to him with the keenest enjoyment, maintaining at the same time the most resolute composure of countenance, and except in an occasional glance at Elizabeth, requiring no partner in his pleasure. By tea time, however, the dose had been enough, and Mr. Bennet was glad to take his guest into the drawing room again, and when tea was over, glad to invite him to read aloud to the ladies. Mr. Collins readily assented, and a book was produced, but on beholding it, for everything announced it to be from a circulating library, he started back, and begging pardon, begging pardon, protested that he never read novels. Kitty stared at him, and Lydia exclaimed. Other books were produced, and after some deliberation, he chose Fordyce's sermons. Lydia gaped as he opened the volume, and before he had, with very monotonous solemnity, read three pages, she interrupted him with, do you know, Mama, that my Uncle Phillips talks of turning away Richard? And if he does, Colonel Forster will hire him. My aunt told me so herself on Saturday. I shall walk to Meryton tomorrow to hear more about it and to ask when Mr. Denny comes back from town. Lydia was bid by her two eldest sisters to hold her tongue, but Mr. Collins, much offended, laid aside his book and said, I have often observed how little young ladies are interested by books of a serious stamp, though written solely for their benefit. It amazes me, I confess, for certainly there can be nothing so advantageous to them as instruction. But I will no longer importune my young cousin. Then, turning to Mr. Bennet, he offered himself as his antagonist at backgammon. Mr. Bennet accepted the challenge, observing that he acted very wisely in leaving the girls to their own trifling amusements. Mrs. Bennet and her daughters apologized most civilly for Lydia's interruption, and promised that it should not occur again if he would resume his book, but Mr. Collins, after assuring them he, that he bore his young, his, his young cousin no ill will, and should never resent her behavior as any affront, seated himself at another table with Mr. Bennet and prepared for backgammon. It's the end of the chapter. Let's, yeah, yeah, let's skip ahead. Let's just, let's read chapter 15, Roman numerals, XV, 15. Chapter 15. Mr. Collins was not a sensible man, and the deficiency of nature had been but little assisted by education or society. The greatest part of his life having been spent under the guidance of an illiterate and miserly father, and though he belonged to one of the universities, he had merely kept the necessary terms without forming at it any useful acquaintance. The subjection in which his father had brought him up had given him originally great humility of manner, but it was now a good deal counteracted by the self-conceit of a weak head, living in retirement, and the consequential feelings of early and unexpected prosperity.' 
A fortunate chance had recommended him to Lady Catherine de Bourgh when the living of Hunsford was vacant, and the respect which he felt for her high rank, and his veneration for her as his patroness, mingling with a very good opinion of himself, of his authority as a clergyman, and his right as a rector, made him altogether a mixture of pride and obsequiousness, self-importance and humility. Having now a good house and very sufficient income, he intended to marry, and in seeking a reconciliation with the Longburn family, he had a wife in view, as he meant to choose one of the daughters, if he found them as handsome and amiable as they were represented by common report. This was his plan of amends, of atonement, for inheriting their father's estate. And he thought it an excellent one, full of eligibility and suitableness, and excessively generous and disinterested on his own part. His plan did not vary on seeing them. Miss Bennet's lovely face confirmed his views, and established all his strictest notions of what was due to seniority, and for the first, and for the first evening she was his settled choice. The next morning, however, made an alteration, for in a quarter of an hour's tete-a-tete with Miss Bennet before breakfast, a conversation beginning with his parsonage house and leading naturally to the avowal of his hopes that a mistress for it might be found at Longbourn, produced from her amid very complacent smiles and general encouragement, a caution against the very Jane he had fixed on. As to her younger daughters, she could not take upon her to say, she could not positively answer, but she did not know of any prepossession. Her eldest daughter, she must just mention, she felt it incumbent on her to hint, was likely to be very soon engaged. Mr. Collins had only to change from Jane to Elizabeth, and it was soon done, done while Mrs. Bennet was stirring the fire. Elizabeth, equally next to Jane in birth and beauty, succeeded her, of course. Mrs. Bennet treasured up the hint and trusted that she might soon have two daughters married, and the man whom she could not bear to speak of the day before was now high in her good graces. Lydia's intention of walking to Meryton was not forgotten. Every sister except Mary agreed to go with her, and Mr. Collins was, was to attend them, at the request of Mr. Bennet, who was most anxious to get rid of him, and to have his library to himself, for thither, for thither, thither, what a word, for thither Mr. Collins had followed him after breakfast, and there he would continue, nominally, nominally engaged with one of the largest folios in the, in the collection, but really talking to Mr. Bennet, with little cessation, of his house and garden at Hunsford. Such doings discomposed Mr. Bennet exceedingly. In his library, he had always been sure of leisure and tranquility, and though prepared, as he told Elizabeth, to meet with folly and conceit in every other room in the house, he was used to be free from them there. His civility, therefore, was most prompt in inviting Mr. Collins to join his daughters in their walk, and Mr. Collins, being, in fact, much better fitted for a walker than a reader, was extremely well pleased to, to close his large book and go. In pompous nothings on his side, and civil assents on that of his cousins, their time passed till they entered Meryton. The attention of the younger ones was then no longer to be gained by him. Their eyes were immediately wandering up the street in quest of the officers, and nothing less than a very smart bonnet indeed, or a really new muslin in a shop window could recall them. But the attention of every lady was soon caught by a young man, whom they had never seen before, of most gentlemanlike appearance, walking with an officer on the other side of the way. The officer was the very Mr. Denny concerning whose return from London Lydia came to inquire, and he bowed as they passed. All were struck with the stranger's air, all wondered who he could be, and Kitty and, Kitty and Lydia, determined if possible to find out, led the way across the street under pretense of wanting something in an opposite shop, and fortunately had just gained the pavement when the two gentlemen, turning back, had reached the same spot. Mr. Denny addressed them directly, and entreated permission to introduce his friend, Mr. Wickham, who had returned with him the day before from town, and he was happy to say had accepted a commission in their corps. This was exactly as it should be, for the young man wanted only regimentals to make him completely charming.' 
His appearance was greatly in his favor. He had all the best part of beauty, a fine countenance, a good figure, and very pleasing address. The introduction was followed up on his side by a happy readiness of conversation, a readiness at the same time perfectly correct and unassuming, and the whole party were still standing and talking together very agreeably when the sound of horses drew their notice, and Darcy and Bingley were seen riding down the street. On distinguishing the ladies of the group, the two gentlemen came directly towards them and began the usual civilities. Bingley was the principal spokesman, and Miss Bennet the principal object. He was then, he said, on his way to Longburn on purpose to inquire after her. Mr. Darcy corroborated it with a bow, and was beginning to determine not to fix his eyes on Elizabeth when they were suddenly arrested by the sight of the stranger, and Elizabeth, happening to see the countenance of both as they looked at each other, was all astonishment at the effect of the meeting. Both changed color. One looked white, the other red. Mr. Wickham, after a few moments, touched his hat, a salutation which Mr. Darcy just deigned to return. What could be the meaning of it? It was impossible to imagine. It was impossible not to long to know. In another minute, Mr. Bingley, but without seeming to have noticed what passed, took leave and rode on with his friend. Mr. Denny and Mr. Wickham walked with the young ladies to the door of Mr. Phillips' house, and then made their bows, in spite of Miss Lydia's pressing entreaties, that they would come in, and even in spite of, and even in spite of Mrs. Phillips throwing up the parlor window and loudly seconding the, int the invitation. Mrs. Phillips was always glad to see her nieces, and the two eldest, from their recent absence, were particularly welcome, and she was eagerly expressing her surprise at their sudden return home, which, as their own carriage had not fetched them, she should have known nothing about, if she had not happened to see Mr. Jones's shop-boy in the street, who had told her that they were not to send any more drafts to Netherfield, because the Miss Bennets were come away, when her civility was claimed towards Mr. Collins by Jane's introduction of him. She received him with her very best politeness, which he returned with as much more, apologizing for his intrusion without any previous acquaintance with her, which he could not help flattering himself, however, might be justified by his relationship to the young ladies who introduced him to her notice. Mrs. Phillips was quite awed by such an excess of good breeding, but her contemplation of one stranger was soon put up was soon put an end to by exclamation and inquiries about the other, of whom, however, she could only tell her nieces what they already knew, that Mr. Denny had brought him from London, and that he was to have a lieutenant's commission in the shire. She had been watching him in the last hour, she said, as he walked up and down the street, and had Mr. Wickham appeared, Kitty and Lydia would certainly have continued the, the occupation. But, unluckily, no one passed the windows now except for a few of the officers who, in comparison with a stranger, were become stupid, stupid, disagreeable fellows. Some of them, some of them were to dine with the Phillipses the next day, and their aunt promised to make her husband call on Mr. Wickham and give him an invitation also, if the family from, from Longburn would agree, would come in the evening. This was agreed to, and Mrs. Phillips protested that they would have a nice, comfortable, noisy game of lottery tickets, and a little bit of hot supper afterwards. The prospect of such delights was very cheering, and they parted in mutual good spirits. Mr. Collins repeated his apologies in quitting the room, and was assured with unwearying civility that they were perfectly needless. As they walked home, Elizabeth related to Jane what she had seen pass between the two gentlemen— and though Jane would have, defend, would have defended either or both, had they appeared to be wrong, she could no more explain such behavior than her sister. Mr. Collins, on his return, highly gratified Mrs. Bennet by admiring Mrs. Phillips's manners and politeness. He protested that, except Lady Catherine and her daughter, he had never seen a more elegant woman, for she had not only received him with the utmost civility, but had even pointedly included him in her invitation for the next evening, although utterly unknown to her before. Something, he supposed, might be attributed to his connection with them, but yet he had never met with so much attention in the whole course of his life." That's the end of chapter 15. Uh, great. Well, turns out Mr. Collins, still very insufferable, 
Lydia, still very obnoxious. Uh, and we have met this new, interesting Mr. Wickham character who seems like very nice. Um, cool. Great. Well, uh, let's find out what happens next tomorrow night, 7 p.m. Um, we'll catch up on chapter 16. All right. I'll see you then. Stay safe, stay healthy, take care of each other, do something nice for yourself, or like just maybe that's just going to bed early, taking a hot shower. I don't know, whatever. Uh, take care of yourself, and I'll see you again at seven tomorrow.